everyone and welcome to Academic Research Logs. This week we are looking at how to select research participants for qualitative research. So for a qualitative researcher, they want to generate meaning. They want to explore how things are the way they are. And they see the construct of reality through the perspective of their participants. And it, it's also important that they obtain an in-depth and rich detail of the topic that they are exploring. So when it comes to sampling and obtaining participants for qualitative studies, it's, it's not based on chance. The, the, the researcher would often have uh, a specific criteria and a specific set of criteria that they are looking for to make sure that the participants that are involved in the study have a can provide a rich and in-depth information about the particular topic that they are exploring. So sampling and selection of participants can be heterogeneous or can be homogeneous. So heterogeneous just means, for example, say a researcher is looking at the experience of ED doctors and nurses in the provision of end of life care. So even though all the participants have the experience that's required to provide the information needed by the researcher, however, they will be from different age groups, they might have different education levels, they might have different socioeconomic status as well. So Having an heterogeneous sample is just a way of obtaining different perspectives that's related to that particular question. An homogeneous sample, on the other hand, again, you have participants that, of course, have an in-depth understanding of what's required by the researcher, but they all have the same demographical characteristics. So same age group, same socioeconomic status, same educational level. So that's just the differences. Some researcher will use both heterogeneous sample and homogeneous sam sample methods mixed together. So their participants will have often have those characteristics all together. There are different types of sampling as well. So you've got your purposive sampling You've got your convenience sampling, which is just the one of the easiest, least rigorous type of sampling. You've got your snowballing that we called referred sampling as well. So in purposive sampling, an example would be, say you've got a research topic on end of life care provisions by emergency department doctors and nurses. The selection criteria in a purposive sampling would be that the Participants would be current ED doctors and nurses. They must work in an emergency department. Additional criteria could be, say, the number of years they've worked, the setting in which they work, which could be a metropolitan setting or maybe, say, a rural area, or maybe the years of work in the years that they've worked as well. So you can see how you've got those set criteria, but it fits into what the researcher wants. So it's it's quite purposive. It has to fit into that criteria. If it doesn't fit, then it doesn't match what the researcher is looking for. In convenience sampling, however, um, so for example, if the same, we'll pick the same topic again. So end of life care in ED by doctors and nurses, the researcher would often just pick participants that they work with. So it's it's called convenience sampling because it is actually convenient. You don't have to advertise the study. Um, you don't have to spread with word of mouth or try to get into a particular group. Um, you have access to the sample because you work with them. So you can just ask them and say, oh, I'm doing this study and I know you fit the criteria. Can you come and give me and speak to me about your experiences? So that's convenient sampling. So that's another way you can access participants. Another way that 
participants can be accessed in qualitative studies as well is the snowballing sampling. And this is a form of sampling that we also refer to as network sampling. So this is where the people where you have um, asked and spoken to who have given you um, their experiences about the topic now speak to other people that they know that will be interested in the topic as well. So it's, it's, it's like a snowball. So, you know, when you have a small snowball and then it rolls along and picks up more snow as it rolls along and keeps picking up more snow and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's what it is literally. You know, one person, start with one person and then they talk to another person that thinks fits and will be interested and then it gets bigger and bigger from there. So there is another thing we call saturation. So once you've collected all of your data, you reach saturation when you are not uncovering any new or additional data. So you've done your interviews, you've got your participants, you've done a couple of interviews, and now you're not getting any other new information. This is when in qualitative data, qualitative sampling methods um, would often stop because now you know that you've reached saturation. And one of the goals of qualitative methodologies and sampling is, is not about how many participants you've got. It's about creating a deep understanding and meaning of the topic. So a few tips before we finish. As you go ahead and start collecting your sample and start doing your sample selection and participant selection, just remember that a large sample size cannot make up for a poor study design. So if your study design or the, your research process is, up, is poor, it doesn't matter how big your sample size is, it's not going to make up for it. Or if you don't have good interview practices or good interview, interviewing skills, um, it's not going to make up for it. Oversampling is another thing that can happen as well. Um, and over generalizability. Remember that qualitative studies does not aim to overgeneralize. So just remember in qualitative studies, there are some criteria that are different to other types of study. So thank you very much and I'll see you again in the next video. Bye.